As the holiday activities begin, the streets are filled with all kinds of creatures of the night. Some wear masks to disguise their dark intentions, while others choose to hide in plain sight. So warning to those of you collecting your treats and filling your bellies, keep your wits about you. And don't forget to check your candy. Hello and welcome. Welcome and hello. This is Wait, You Haven't Seen? It's a show where we talk about movies and specifically, we talk about a movie at least one of us has never seen before. I'm your host, Travis, aka TV's Travis. This is episode number 239 in our movie this week from 2015. It's the anthology Tales of Halloween. And joining me to talk about it, as they have been for the last couple weeks, it's the podcast of gore. And from the gore podcast, we have the Wicked Kitten. Always getting into mischief, Monica. Well, hello there, Travis. You staying spooky this time of year? You do that really well, I'm just going to say. You could, uh, <laughs> you, know, you could make some extra money on the side doing that. Uh, also with us is the endearing, the ethereal Faye. Hi, hi. And mostly awake, Dread. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the same time zone as me. Yes, from another undisclosed location, but this time within the eastern time zone of the United States. So that's as close as I'll get to saying where you are. Um, so, all right, Tales of Halloween. Uh, show of hands, starting with Dread. Had you seen this before? I did. Okay. What's your history with it? When did you see it for the first time? A couple of years ago. I've only seen it once before this time. Uh, so a couple of years ago. Um, I did remember it, which means a lot. Uh, yeah. And re-watching it, I did I, I did like, oh, yeah, that story. Oh, yeah, that story. Yeah, that story. So um, <laughs> positive. Very positive. So, yeah. Well, that's good. Monica, how about you? Had, uh, had you, you had seen this before, right? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'm the one that recommended it. Uh, I probably saw it like I don't know, maybe like five years ago, because I remember last year I was gonna I was gonna say we should do this one, and uh, I think Faye had already picked one or you did for the anthology movie. Mm -hmm. um, but this is just this is something that I saw and I just thought it's just so cute and funny and um, it's got some great cameos and stuff and it's just so much fun. Yeah, um, last year we did XX. Uh, which yeah, was, that was it. which was pretty fun. Um, it was an interesting, interesting anthology. Faye, how about you? Had you seen this one before? No, this is the first time. Mm, okay. Uh, same for me. This is also the first time I had watched it. So, uh, we, Dread remembered it, which means it was obviously had a positive impact on him. Um, so that's good. Obviously, we know Monica likes it. Uh, what did you think of it? Huh? I liked it. Some of the stories were kind of meh, but then mm -hmm. other ones were really good. So, I mean, it's pretty par for a typical good anthology. Yeah. We'll kind of dive into the individual stories. There's 10 stories in this, which is I didn't expect. Yeah. Um, I liked it. Uh, I had a good time with it. Uh, Monica, you put it perfectly. It's fun. And I think that's yeah. that is one thing that sets this one apart. I love... Uh, horror anthologies. I think horror and sci-fi um, and to a certain extent fantasy uh, as well, but horror and sci-fi really lend themselves to to short stories um, and anthology movies or anthology series in that realm I think work really, really well. So I love a good horror anthology. That's why we do one every year for this show. Um, and last year's was really interesting because XX and it was all uh, women directors for all of the segments and I thought that was a, a really fun one to do but this one I had I had heard of and I had seen the poster plenty of times the the yeah. poster with the tree that and the skull just... mm -hmm. it gets you um I had no idea this was 10 stories I you know, typically when I think of an anthology I think of something like trick or treat or tales from the dark side or creep show where it's anywhere from three to five is usually what you get in a feature length yeah. anthology movie each one gets 
somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 minutes to kind of tell their story. Um, and then you have your wraparound, and that's usually what you get. Trick or Treat is interesting in that it doesn't really have the normal structure of an anthology of here's story A, here's story B, here's story C. They do that, but they're all interwoven a little more, uh, I don't want to say seamlessly, but they're they're more interconnected in that they're, the transitions are very subtle. Um, this was like, here's your story, fade to black, fade in, here's your next one. But it was 10 of them, so they're all in that like eight, nine minute range. And I kind of thought that was that was a cool way to go about it. It does lean to, as all anthologies do, like you said, Faye, some some stories are going to be better than others. Um, 10 is a lot to go through. Uh, so I'm impressed, Dread, that you remembered uh, so much of it. <laughs> if you'd only seen it one Thank time. Thank um, <laughs> But uh, it does... I sort of look at this... This sort of broke down into two tiers for me. Um, because I think overall, genu generally, I liked all of the stories for one reason or another. Uh, but there was sort of a... Mm -hmm. The, there were five of them that were kind of a better tier of story than the other five. The the bottom five, like if I'm ranking them in a in a one to ten, my six through ten aren't so much that I didn't like them. It's that they just needed a little something else. They needed another like five minutes of story to to really kind of round out. Um, but uh, yeah, this is super fun. I love. You know your your uh, your hello your intro there, Monica, as doing your Adrian Barbeau voice. Uh, I loved having mm -hmm. her as the radio announcer. Yes, basically was... reenacting her role from uh, the Fog. Yep, and uh, and she's got a great voice, and it was fun. I think she was at like the first story, and then sort of didn't say anything for the next couple. And then would pop up again. I felt like I would just wanted more of that because, again, she's just so good. Um, mm -hmm. But that was a lot I agree. of fun. I wanted, to, I wanted her to do the intro of each one, but yeah. then others were playing and there was no intro. It was like, wait, no, <laughs> no, put back. <laughs> I wonder how much of that was uh, on purpose and how much of that was like they just didn't record anything. Because a lot of these, I was reading that a lot of these shorts were shot in like two days. So oh, wow. pretty quickly, you know, and, and you can see some of it like, again, no, there's nothing like groundbreaking here. I wouldn't call this, this is a fun anthology. It's not one of my favorites. Like I'm still, I think if I were to pick an anthology film to watch for horror around this time, I'm probably going to lean towards either the first two creep shows or trick or treat before I get to tales of Halloween. And that's not a knock on this movie at all. Um, I just think those are, just a little bit better. There's something there. There's just an extra yeah, something yeah. to those movies. Yeah, I think so. Um, so also yeah. this did have just people up and down the cast showing up and stuff. That was <laughs> awesome. Cause all yeah. right. So I knew you'd like that. <laughs> um, would you say it's uh, the, the creator of this was uh, Excel Carolyn, I guess a X E L L E Axel. Um, but that's who created the the idea for this and got together directors. Um, and we actually had some directors of stuff we've watched before. Um, there was uh, who Neil Marshall uh, directed the last one, Bad Seed. He's done things like um, Doomsday and The Descent and Dog Soldiers uh, were all Neil Marshall films. Um, what was the other one? Uh, do, do, do. Neil Marshall, um, Adam Gersh did Trick, who I've I've heard the name before. Darren Lynn Bousman, uh, who did Repo, the Genetic Opera. Um, his mm -hmm. segment was The Night Billy Raised Hell. Um, and uh, there was another name in here that I recognized. Lucky McKee uh, did Ding Dong, and I've I've seen that name before. But they're they're names that are somewhat familiar. The writers, um, they all kind of co-wrote their little segments. Um, and you could tell a lot of them would bring along the actors that they have worked with before. So like Barry Bostwick shows up, um, in, uh, in one of them, but let, let's kind of go through. So there's, there's 10 stories. So we start off with, um, Sweet Tooth. Sweet Tooth. And 
uh, Sweet Tooth was directed and written by Dave Parker. And um, I'm pretty sure Dave Parker uh, is a big John Carpenter fan because there were all sorts of John Carpenter uh, Easter eggs in his particular segment. Mm -hmm. Um, The most blatant of them was I loved the Carpenter bar that the kid sets down. That's the, uh, the, the candy bar that he sets down. Um, but that was the story of this kid is getting told a ghost story on Halloween by the babysitter of the, the, this creature of sweet tooth that, uh, was a kid in the neighborhood who loved to trick or treat, but his parents wouldn't ever let him eat candy until one year he snuck downstairs and saw them eating all of his candy and then having sex and snapped. <laughs> and so he snapped and killed That's them. That's how you eat candy. <laughs> He pulled a Michael. Yeah, and he becomes <laughs> Sweet Tooth, and then you have to leave candy out for him every year. And it's, a, I love that because that's a fun, like that's a fun little story to tell, um, scare the kid, but then it actually happens. Sweet mm-hmm. Tooth shows up at the house. Um, by the way, did, who who recognized the kid's costume, the little boy, in that segment? Anybody? So he's got the he's got an eye patch. And oh he yeah, has, is he a pirate? Snake Plissken. No, snake. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've no, I that haven't a, seen that movie. So. Okay, well, that's another John Carpenter <laughs> reference. So that was another good one. I, I have it was to. my my first my second note actually. My first note was like Adrian Barbeau. All right. Uh, second one was nice <laughs> Snake Plissken costume. Yep. Um, I liked uh, I liked Sweet Tooth. I liked this particular segment. It was the right mix of of gory silly you're not sure the first half if it's going to be supernatural or not and it's just a scary story but then the the creature shows up and it's like whoa okay we're we're going there um and then you get greg grunberg uh making a cameo right at the end um with him and uh who was the uh, mom for that segment um claire kramer claire kramer and they were playing uh they're credited with their names uh their character names from a movie they did called Big Ass Spider a couple of years before this so they're That they're, sounds like something we need to cover. They're dressed in their costumes it's, from that movie. I'm okay with it. <laughs> it's an interesting movie. <laughs> interesting. That sounds scary. <laughs> um but yeah, I liked Sweet Tooth. I thought that it uh it was like the perfect horror short story. Um like kind of structure right where you start off and it's just the babysitter and the kid and they tell him the scary story and he goes to bed and then it gets a little weirder a little weirder but then it has that that short story ending where the parents come home and they find him standing in the room with the two with the dead babysitter and her boyfriend just eviscerated gutted right there and all he says is they ate all of my candy and we cut to black (laughs) Yep. I, was, I love that. <laughs> that was great. So that was a really fun uh, and a strong one to open with, too. I think they, they picked a really good story to open and start stuff off with. Um, yeah. Also, I think there was just the right amount of uh, Sweet Tooth creature scene. Yeah. Because I liked yeah, that the... That was a dis- creepy looking dude. <laughs> right? Because like, mis- he's missing yeah. like his lower jaw, basically. Like yeah. the lower half All of his All that sugar. Face. Yeah, I know it'll do it to you. So that was creepy. I liked the the look of it. The uh, it's gruesome with how the kid guts the parents and then the babysitter and everything. But it also kind of doesn't look real at the same time. I don't know. It's like it's yeah. so. Well, yeah, it looks good though. I like how it looks. Oh yeah. Well, there's no. like chocolate mixed in, so. That's true. Yeah. That was <laughs> that makes everything better. <laughs> that was one of the parts that actually made me laugh the most was when the kid comes, grabs the the cleaver to go after his parents, and they've just got chocolate all over their mouths. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Because there's one thing I noticed. The parents also. <laughs> go ahead. I was gonna say the parents are played by like veteran horror actors, uh, Carolyn Williams and Robert Rustler. Oh yeah. Uh, Carolyn was in like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies and a bunch of other stuff. And Robert Ressler was in, he was like the best friend in Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. Mm. And, you know, I love to see that. Oh, yeah. Um, I noticed something in this movie that 
was kind of a through line. Everybody in this little town eats candy like feral children. Like uh, sure. sweet, tooth, sweet Tooth opens up and the kid is eating candy and it's mimicked with uh, the other through line throughout everything is Night of the Living Dead is playing on every TV. Yep. And oh, yeah. zombies eating flesh. He's eating candy like the zombies eating flesh in Night of the Living Dead and like mm-hmm. eyes rolling back. Um, when the parents are eating the candy, they're doing the same thing. And then, of course, we see them looking like uh, Augustus Gloop with just chocolate all over their faces. I'm confused. Don't you all do that? Is that not a normal thing? Um, no. Not quite oh. to that extent. No. Although I haven't had oh. any candy in a while, so maybe I will. Who knows? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I really, I think that was a strong open to go with, with uh, Sweet Tooth, because it is the ghost story. Um, so it is, it's easy to have a nice lead in with Adrian Barbeau. And then it's got the wonderful cliffhanger ending of just they ate all my candy. Because you have to wonder, what are the parents thinking? <laughs> you mm-hmm. like you? Yeah. I want to know a follow up to that, but I also kind of don't at the same time because who? <laughs> so it's frightening to think of where that went. Um, but then we go to our second segment. The only note I had, oh, the only note I had for the first segment is like the, when they're telling the story and you see the parents of the the kid. Yeah. Um, never trust parents who dress like that at home. Right. Yeah, no. <laughs> that is, yeah. no. Red flag. Yeah. That's what that is. It's a red flag. Um, yeah, I, I like that one. And then we get into story number two, uh, The Night Billy Raised Hell. Um, anyone catch what uh, boyfriend's costume was there? Because I recognized it. Any hook fans <laughs> out there? The boy, the boyfriend, because we, the, the oh, second segment. Oh, the boyfriend. <laughs> The Sorry, second, yeah. I you meant it like... No, no, no. The second segment starts off with the kid dressed as the, you know, in a devil costume with his older yeah. sister as a cheerleader and her boyfriend who's dressed like Rufio from Hook. Really Rufio. poorly done, but, oh. but he's Rufio. Um, and uh, they're. That one did have uh, a little, a use of a word that I don't particularly like a whole lot uh, that he calls him. Um, he calls the kid uh, at one point the the older the older kid uses the R word. Um, I was like, ah, okay, so that hasn't aged very well. But it was 2015; it hadn't quite been, uh, yeah, quite been as stigmatized at that time at that point. Like it still it was, but not quite as bad. I don't know. It's it's one that for me I notice that when I hear it now. Um. But they they tell the kid you gotta you gotta do pranks. So he get, he hands him an egg to go uh, throw an egg at the the neighbor's house in broad daylight because that's how you do that, and not you know the night before Halloween. But sure. And I love Barry Bostwick, pops out, mm-hmm. and <laughs> he's great. He's credited as Mister Abaddon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he grabs the kid and then he says, "I'm gonna teach you what a real prank is." By the way. Is your mom dressing up again this year? <laughs> Which <laughs> that that's the team there, slutty mom. <laughs> yeah, because the 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 uh, boyfriend had said the same thing, asked him the same yep. question. Can I say the best part though? Because it's like after he get, grabs the egg right when the kid throws it, and then he like throws it back, and the other people run away. When the kid is just still standing there, and he like turns, and he's just like startled all of a sudden. Like you knew the kid was there. Yeah, Why are you startled, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Abaddon? Exactly. <laughs> And this was the segment done by Darren Lid Baus, uh, so or Bo, Boseman. So he um, he had worked with Barry Bostwick before, and I loved um, when uh, Abaddon grabs the egg and he hits the kid going across the street with it, right in the middle of the back, and knocks him down. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, that sound effect though. Boing. There were a lot of cartoonish sound effects in this. I captured one of yeah, them. Loved that. Um, but this this particular segment was. Very over the top cartoony, um, and I loved that because you know you could just tell Barry was having a blast playing this character and just overacting the hell out of it. Uh, air guitaring with his most good actors. Most good actors love playing the villain and ham it up. Oh sure, mm. but he um, 
he tells the kid that we're going to do, uh, I'm going to show you what a real prank is. And then we cut to that night and he's taking the kid out trick or treating and they do all sorts of horrible things. Like one, one of my notes was, wow, the pranks really escalated quickly because <laughs> it just went from, Very. it went from like, we're going to do pranks to stabbing people and pulling a gun on them and robbing yeah. a convenience store. <laughs> like what is going on? And at some point I noticed that the uh, the kid in the devil costume, I'm like, that's not a child. That is definitely a little nope. person in the costume. Yeah. Um, but then you never know if it's like, are they are they just using like a stunt actor that's... to do certain scenes? And you're mm-hmm. like, okay, I have to wait to find out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was my thought was like, well, they just have so that they don't have to have a kid, you know, a child actor acting this stuff out. And it's shot at night, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then there was a narrative reason for it because it's, it's what is, uh, I can't remember mm-hmm. what his name was. Um, but it's Mr. Abaddon's little Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai that's what it was. Yeah. And they had Billy tied up at home names. the whole time. Yeah, Billy yeah. still gets the blame. Yep. <laughs> Not just the blame. Um, that ends on a real dark note. Also the so, saying. Yes. What was with that? So the so he he unties Billy and and sends him out right as the cops are showing up. And he goes out in the front yard and the police are all riding up because they've been on just a, a string of mayhem all night, right? They've been shooting people, running people over with the car, which I love that scene, uh, that part in particular, because you could, this is where you could tell the budget was low because when they get into the car, it's just shots of Barry Bostwick in the car, like eating KFC and drinking a big gulp and yelling about running people over in the car but you never see the car you never see anybody getting hit because they just didn't have time to do like stunt work or setups or anything so that cracked me up but uh no the kid goes out the police show up and then they yell at him they comment that he's peeing his pants and then it fades (laughs) to black and you hear a couple of gunshots they did they shoot the kid why for peeing his pants what the hell exactly (laughs) yeah well, well yeah. apparently he caused a ruckus. Yeah, he caused yeah. a ruckus, killed people, ran people over, you know. Yeah, because no one else could be dressed like that. Because that, that, that was a very unique costume he was wearing. No well, that is he true. also, the, the the spray paint on the on the uh, garage door. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Still, though, I feel like this is not a reason to shoot someone. Especially Just not that a you child. are correct. <laughs> You well, are correct. It's not himself. a reason to do it. <laughs> but, you know, we're dealing with cops. And it was that everything in that segment up until that point, it, the gunshots, I think I would have cut. Not so much just because, like, it just didn't, it felt weird to me. Because I was like, what? Hold on. Wait, and then, when it's, nope, we're going on to the next story. Forget about it. But I still enjoyed that one. I thought that was a really well put together yeah. um one it had good music to it as well which makes sense true and also just saying uh f dentists for handing out <laughs> apples or toothpaste or whatever <laughs> instead yep. of candy i'd be like candy is bad for your teeth ha 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 well and that was yeah but you think as a dentist they'd hand out more coffee or candy so candy. that they get more visits you know, yeah any... that is true yeah. actually <laughs> um but I did love, like, the Im- immediate, he just grabs it and, like, <laughs> sharpens it into a shiv and hands it back to him. And they, so I, I did, I enjoyed um, The Night Billy Raised Hell. I think that, for me, it's uh, in that second tier for this anthology. I think it's good, but there was a couple I liked better. Um, but it was good. It was It was fun, and like I say, Barry Bostwick just hamming it up. When they light the the stuff on fire and he's air guitaring with the uh, cane <laughs> and uh, doing the whole, you know, hey, yeah. Billy, is your mom dressing up? Eyebrow raise. And they add in like the sound effects for his raised eyebrows and all of that. It was really good. What was the thing that he says at the end? He's like, your mom's going to be real busy. Oh, your mom's going to have a it. lot of free time. Oh, that's what it is. Your mom's going to have a lot of free time. I'm just I'll, like, Ugh. yeah, I'll make sure to, to uh, visit her or something like that. <laughs> Yeah. Um. So the next one was Trick, right? The one with the kids. Yes. Yes. Or, so, or as I would title it, "Children of the Candy." Children, <laughs> children of the Candy, <laughs> of the candy Corn. Um. 
Trick was interesting. Trick had some of the um, more unique camera work because they had. Uh, I really liked the long shot following her out to the car. Um, oh I'm yes, a, yes. I'm a sucker for that, and I love when you build yep. your sets and you set up your track perfectly so your camera can move along, and it feels like it's moving through walls, even though you know. Like I know it's going kind of around and over structures and stuff like that, but I really liked that. There was the one shot afterwards uh, wh- that had like the real Dutch tilt where the girl walks up and eats the piece of candy and it's all done in one long shot. Um, but Trick for me was one of the weaker entries in this only because why? There was like nothing... I get what they were going for, the shock value of like these just crazy, you know, kids just because it's it's a group of four adults sitting there watching the movie and then they're getting up to answer the door and he answers the door one last time and it's a girl in a witch costume um, who looked very similar to the girl dressed as a witch wearing glasses from Trick or Treat, by the way. Um, and when he asks her Trick or Treat, she just pulls a knife and stabs him like six times and says Trick and runs off. And then the kids go all murderous, and they're they're killing oh, yeah. all of them, uh, pretty brutally. Like the well, the uh, I thought it was fun. And, like and... I, I just like I love I loved watching the the kids be creep because creepy kids, murderous kids. Oh. I'm not saying it was top tier. It definitely was probably in the second tier. But like, like I do enjoy watching kids be murdery, Children of the Corn style. I I mean they were murdery for a reason. Yeah, yes, and, exactly. and that's actually part of what puts this in the second tier for me is that they're murdery for a reason, but because it's only like nine minutes long and we spend so much mm-hmm. of it with the kids stabbing the guy and the flamethrower and then pouring a bunch of rat poison into his mouth and taping it shut and all of that <laughs> stuff, the 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 twist reveal of this story that these adults had some weird torture chamber plastic lined thing in their garage and they were torturing kids in there feels like it needed another couple of minutes to kind of give i don't know i i felt like there was just just something not quite there for the the story which is what knocked it to the second tier because i agree with you that just having creepy kids is kind of interesting and it's fun, and it's just great to see them like go ham on on everything. But there's a there's literally like a child strapped to the table when she runs in there in the dark, that doesn't make a sound. It was a little off putting. Um, it's just I just wanted just a touch more in that one, which is what knocked it to that second tier for me. Um, it looked good. Uh, I think that. It was fine. I just just wanted some more story there because of the reveal of it yeah. was so quick at the end. And, like, were all four of them involved in it? Is that what he was showing the girl on his phone? Like, hey, check this one out. Um, I don't know. So it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Like I said, yeah. there wasn't there wasn't a segment in this I didn't like. Um, it just some of them were a little weaker than the others. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, Trick definitely is like, oh, okay, we're just uh, just kids murdering people. Just but, going right for it. Including uh, slicing of the Achilles. And that one always gets me. Oh, no. Under the car, that is my greatest <laughs> fear. I check my car. Sometimes I jump into it. Like, I don't like thinking about that. And anytime it happens in a movie, I'm just... Uh, this is why I can't do killer dolls. Like Chucky, he would go for the Achilles. You have a thing for like thing. your ankles and Achilles, right? Because it's like underneath the car, staircases that have an open yes. bottom to them that somebody could reach through if you're walking down the stairs. Like I've That's, noticed that. I don't mm-hmm. like Jump that. into your bed too, I bet. <laughs> yeah, do you, does your bed, do, do you have like, do you check under the bed before or anything like that? I have or? a futon. Okay, so, so see, nothing can so really fit under yes. there. You sort of a mitigated that even. issue. <laughs> but there's like, there, cause it's like technically you could be under there, but there's like a box. So like, you know, there, there's, you know, you know what I mean? Like I kick something if I kick underneath the bed. Right. So nothing can be there. I picked my bed on purpose <laughs> is what I'm trying to tell you. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no pet cemetery, huh? <laughs> yeah, the only the only thing I have to worry about is much like four rooms that there'll be like a dead person inside the mattress <laughs> randomly. Did did somebody do that to you when you were younger? Did they grab your your ankles or something and they put that fear in you? Do you where do you think that came from? I don't know. I think it's a lot of movies and just yeah. I think there's like a That's there's very, like a yeah. That's face said. There's a lot of like um, a trilogy of terror. If anyone's ever seen that, that oh, will yeah. put the fear of little things in you. Um, there's yeah. just there's something about things that can get to the thing that will help you run away. You know, because if you get stabbed in the arm, like. You could still run, right? But if yeah. they get your Achilles, you're dead. That's yeah, it's hard. Although to I'm get not away. really running anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> still, though, you, you have a better chance on two good legs than you do on one. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. Um, then the the next segment, uh, we get Adrian Barbeau back. Yay. Um, she leads mm -hmm. us into the weak and the wicked, and this one was one of my favorites. Wicked. Um. In, in this. I really like The Week and the Wicked. Um, and I think what I liked about it was it was the Western of oh, yes. the whole set. Like it was structured and shot like a Western. And I, I kind of dug that. I caught it right away. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And there here again, you've got uh, an older kid sort of dressed like a sheriff, but he's just thoroughly eating candy in an alley. Like... <laughs> He's just like shoving candy in his face in an alley. Um, when he looks up and sees the bikes all chained up and you see malice on the one bike and he, he knows who that is. And then the, the, you know, pack of street toughs grab him and throw him up against the wall. Now I did like the, here was some more cameos for you. Um, one of those guys, the one that was chewing on the, uh, toothpick, um, was uh oh shoot where's his name noah um noah sagan he is uh good friends with ryan johnson and is in all of ryan johnson's movies so if you saw glass onion he was like the hippie stoner dude that's just wandering around the island in glass onion he was the one of the sheriff's deputies in knives out he was in brick he was in last jedi as he had small roles and and stuff like that um so he's great. I liked him. Uh, I love the other guy in the gang uh, is played by an actor named Boo Boo Stewart. And I just, I think that's a great name. That was the one with the long hair. And then Gracie Gillum played Alice, who was the, the leader of the gang. Um, I just really liked this whole, this whole story. I thought this was a really cool. I love the structure of it being set up like a Western. <laughs> She looked so familiar to me. Yes. But when I looked at her credits, I didn't see anything that I would recognize. I was like, there was like Disney stuff and I'm like, or something like that. And I was like, yeah. no, what yeah, do I, I know her from? But she's I, just got that face. She does. She, she reminds me a little bit of um, Willa Holland, who was in Arrow. Just a little bit. Mm. Uh, and yes. As well, there's a little bit of her there, and then um, who was um, – oh, crap. Her She was an actor in the 90s. She was the Nagazima girl. Shoot, what is her name? You know who I'm talking curly about. Curly hair? Yes, curly hair. Um, uh, 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 Rebecca uh, Gr Gayhart. That's who. There's a little bit of her in there, too. Not oh. not like, oh, that's Rebecca Gayhart, but sort of like, <laughs> oh, she reminds me a bit of her. But yeah. I had the same thing. No, I'm, I as I was watching that. that whole segment, I'm like, I know her from something. And I did the same thing. I looked it up and I'm like, no, I don't. Because I've never seen Teen Beach Movie or Teen Beach 2. <laughs> <laughs> we should. I mean, you can't watch the second without the first. So. Right, exactly. Um, of course. And she was great leading that gang, and they see the dude yeah. at the other end of the, the alley. So you get the whole, I love the standoff as they walk down the alley, and just the way everything was framed and structured out. And then uh, it goes full on like metalhead punk rock with the chase, and the music that starts playing, get some uh, 
I don't I didn't catch who the band was or the song, but um and uh the whole time I'm thinking, okay, did this guy like what is his deal? What did he do? And it turns out he was actually summoning a demon. And <laughs> the demon shows up and once again, budget reasons, we don't see anything. Um, except for the, the small like t-shirt cannon full of blood that shoots onto him, onto the kid right at the end of it, which he kept his eyes open for And that. the the biggest smile you've ever yes. seen. Oh, he, <laughs> he was so it. happy. Oh yeah, he yeah. got his revenge. But there again, like great. Like I say, that was the Western because when he gets to that spot and then we get the flashback to what happened there before. Uh, and I love the idea that um, they burned down the trailer that his parents were in and it was 15 years earlier and the burnt out husk of the trailer is still sitting there. No one's cleaned it up. No one's removed it. It's just there in the wrong side of town. Like that cracked me up. Um, but yeah, then that demon shows up wearing a, a meat skirt and uh, I did like the design of looking the very, <laughs> yeah, looking very, um, Silent Hilly, is that what I said? You, you're thinking one? a pyramid head with with horns. It, I got a little feel <laughs> or, of that. Or yeah. like, a, like something in that world, definitely like modeled with the mm -hmm. mouth and the hornies, or maybe not the hornies, but. And you know, again, I think that this segment could have been maybe a little bit better with more time. Give it another like five or ten minutes to sort of develop a story, but at the same time. This one really worked in that short bit because it was so stylized in the storytelling. And I think the difference between it and Trick right before it was Trick had a cool look, but the story was just like, kids show up, stab a bunch of people. Oh, they're evil. Okay. And then we move on. Like, it was just missing one layer that I think the, uh, the Weak and the Wicked had, which was probably just adding in that flashback of there's a connection between these two and that's why he summoned a demon and we don't get anything beyond. He just figured out how in the last 15, he spent his entire life figuring yeah. out how to get his revenge and he got it. Yeah. This one also feels like the most that would be on a uh, creep show. It kind of does, doesn't I, it? I, yeah. Yeah. I, I can see the cartoonish flashes and, <laughs> and yeah. the art thing with the little demon. Oh yeah. man. I could see that. Like, coming out of this one with a transition where it goes animated for a minute while the demon attacks. Yeah. That would be really yep. cool. So yeah, this was one of my favorites. Um, and uh, the music in it was pretty cool too. I'm a metalhead, so I, I enjoyed that. Um, the next one, again, we get uh, we get Adrian... Uh, no, we don't get Adrian Barbo leading us into Grim Grinning Ghost. Um, but this one had some cameos in it um quite like a the few. most cameos yeah <laughs> so uh lynn shay um starts us off telling the story a favorite of, on the sh on, on gore <laughs> yes uh telling us the story of uh the grim grinning ghost um she's got have the, her she's having a halloween party her daughter lynn is played by uh alexandra esso and during this one was another one where I'm like, okay, why do I know this face? Why do I know this face? We just saw her in Dr. Sleep. She played Wendy in Dr. Sleep. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I read that, I'm like, oh, yep, I see it now. Yeah. Um, so that was her. And then, uh, but we also had uh, Barbara Crampton was uh, dressed Yay. up as the witch, uh, another favorite of ours. Um and did you did you catch uh, Stuart Gordon there? As Sherlock Holmes, yeah. Yep. Along with Mick Garris as the Phantom of the Opera. Yep. He is another directory type person that is really cool. He also does a podcast. <laughs> so that was that was yeah. fun to have all those cameos in that opening scene because then the rest of it is just uh, Lynn on her way home. Um, but this was also one I really liked because. This felt like, uh, like a, a story you would read in you know a short story collection or a creepy pasta online type deal, right? Where you would read about uh, this type of story, and so 
to have it be, you know, a bunch of cameos in the beginning and then just go to a single character and what they're dealing with on their way home, I liked. Um, I thought it was shot really well, again. And uh, and it felt like that... Yeah, and it and it felt like that kind of goosebumps uh, creep show type story where it has again the good cliffhanger ending of it just happens and it's over because they keep setting you up for it and they keep faking you out like you think it's going to happen no it doesn't you think it's going to happen no it doesn't they're, and they're giving you all the the hallmarks right you've got the classic like it's all the tropes of somebody being chased and stalked by a ghost um, when she gets in the car and the song playing. <laughs> I love the song when she's in the car because it's all just you're never alone. I'm watching you all the time. Look behind you type thing the whole time. And then her car, then her car breaks down Then she breaks her phone and she's walking and she hears something behind her. But the story is you can't look behind you. Right. So she doesn't. And then they had uh, I mean, they had the trope of the, you know, the medicine cabinet where she's brushing her teeth opens the medicine cabinet when she closes it nothing there but they make you think there might be uh and then the door Mm -hmm. opens up and it's her dog baby who by the way the the dog uh character's name is baby but he's played by a dog named anubis which is a great name for a dog i feel like they should have kept the anubis i think that's what i said (laughs) um but then it's like you know it's her sitting on the couch watching night of the living dead with with baby when when the dog decides nope i'm out and uh it's, it keeps going keeps going and then you just get that cut back when she and and it's the trophy uh she's leaning forward when she leans back on the couch you see there's the the grim grinning ghost played by v nixie um in their film debut and uh i i looked at their profile in imdb and they kind of feel V Nixie sort of feels a little bit like a um, Doug Jones to me. Like a lot of the images I saw were, um, you know, American Horror Story and all this kind of stuff playing these characters a lot like what Doug Jones does, playing a lot of doing a lot of makeup work and a lot of, uh, you know, just looking creepy. I pulled it off as that ghost because yikes. <laughs> Um, so I liked, I liked a grim grinning ghost as well. I thought that was one of the, the stronger stories in this, yeah. um, for a lot of the same reasons it had, uh, it just felt like one of those fun little stories to, to read. Um, let me get ding dong. So ding dong is written and directed by lucky McKee. I didn't, this was for me, the weakest of them all. Um, and only because I think they should have kept a reveal of her being a demon until the second half of it. Because I think that that fits more of the type of story that they're telling than to reveal it halfway, you know, partway in that she is a demon. Um, I think it, it may, I, and maybe it's just because like it's the Twilight Zone fan in me of like the reveal of something like that right at the end is what I'm I'm more accustomed to. Um, I did. I did very much enjoy uh, the campiness of her performance um, for the second year when she's uh, she's got the the braid with the ear on it and talking about eating Gretel yeah. and eating her ear last so she can listen to it. She can listen to her being chewed on and all that. Um, that was yep. what was her name? Uh, also, boob check. Well, yeah, there was a lot Boop. of boobs shaking. Pollyanna McIntosh um, played Bobby. And I think the reason that I wanted the reveal of her actually being a demon, which was I loved the the design of her as the demon with four arms and she's just painted red, um, but just a little bit weird looking because it's like it's cheap, but not cheap looking at the same time. I don't know. It worked for me. But I think the reason that I wanted her reveal like a reveal of that later was it would make more sense and it would, it would just, it would have played better as a story personally. I don't know if anyone else agrees um, with that or not, but that's how I would have done it. That's literally the only thing I would have done different here. Cause I, I love the idea, the concept of the story. I even love when she turns the oven on and she sets it to 666 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I just I thought the story was so like realistic because there's like this weird dynamic of it being almost a real story of like how you know there's just this woman who wants a child mm -hmm. as opposed to this demon who wants a child you know it was such a it, like i didn't know how to feel about it parts of it annoyed me a lot <laughs> like mostly the husband i think um which it, it's never it's never been my favorite but it's got like some good you know things to see in it but it had great moments yeah. like when they find the the little kid dressed as hansel uh on the front porch and when the husband turns on the light and you just hear, is this one yours? Like to the mom out on the street. I love that. That was time. The timing on that was really great. I think, again, it just comes down to with the way the first part of it is where she's all sad because they can't have kids or they don't have kids. And she's seeing all these children the year before. And even having her like lash out and slap him when he, when he has the dog dressed up, that would have been yeah. fine. But what I wouldn't have done is had it be the demonic arm that hits him and then the whole demonic thing transitioning. I would have just had her freak out and, like, slap him. And then we cut to the next year. And so we get that. It, it would feel it feels very Tales of the Dark Side to all of a sudden reveal that he's married to a demon and she wants a child. And even have it be where she doesn't want a child for nefarious reasons. She just wants a child type of thing, I think, would have would have... It just would have uh, been the way that I would have written it, but that's it. Other uh, the the look of it, the like I say, the the performance is what carries it. Her her the the character of Bobby is just going all for it and just having a ton of fun. So, but yeah, the the husband was annoying. You're right, but I think he was supposed to. Be. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure he was. Plus, the way he phrased getting a vasectomy. By saying, I went to the doctor and he oh made it so I can't give you one. Who says that? Ugh. Like, and that's the thing. So, like, you're watching this and, 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 and it's, it's like she wants a child. And then when he says that, that means that your husband has been lying to you this whole time and giving you false hope. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, he turned into the bad guy at that point. He deserved the oven. That's all I'm well, saying. And that's where, like, you, that's when it's revealed because he's, there's the line, you know, maybe people like us shouldn't have children. And the way you abuse me, uh, I don't want you to do that to a kid. And then to have her then reveal that she's actually this four armed demon. And yeah. I think would have been the I way to do that. it. Because I agree with you that he shouldn't have done that the way that he did. Like, in his mind, he yeah. thinks he's being good and virtuous and saving children but there's nothing really to say that she is evil except that we keep seeing we know she's already a demon but if if it's then revealed that she is then you get the double of like oh well now it makes sense why he would act like this towards her it's not just that she's abusive and she gets justification uh and we're cheering for her throwing him in the oven and, and cooking him so <clears throat> but yeah um so that's uh ding dong which again fine i liked it but it's it's at the bottom of the 10 for me uh this means war yep. was the next one this means war was fun um yeah and this had uh what was his name um dana gould dana gould was boris and james duval was dante james duval um I have seen in uh, Donnie Darko. He played uh, Frank. And he was also in Gone in 60 Seconds. And I loved him in that because he was just a moron in Gone in 60 Seconds. He played Fred. <laughs> he was just this dumb kid that was with Giovanni Ribisi. And he was funny. But I love the idea of, you know, the warring neighbors is always fun. And they're, they're both going all out for their Halloween decorations. But they're of different eras, right? You've got the old school Halloween fan with his tombstones and cobwebs and all of that kind of stuff. And then the new school Halloween uh, fan who's got all heavy metal and body parts strewn about. And I could see it coming when they started fighting. I'm like, Oh, one of them's going to end up getting like impaled by something. I didn't think it was going to be both. You're of half them. Right. I will say that <laughs> I did not expect it to be both of them. Um, but I love like, Nope. I love how the crowd, gets involved and they're starting to watch things they're betting on the fight who's going to win the fight 
And then when the cops show up and the guy that's taking all the bets is like, oh, shit, and just runs off. That made me laugh. The one cop throws up from it, from seeing them both impaled oh, yeah. like that. Um, this one, much like a couple of them, very simple story, um, but it's just good in the execution. Uh, this is, I mean, it's weaker in terms of like a story, but I enjoyed it because of that. Um, because it was just like... You didn't yeah. need to have something big. Yeah. It's just people fighting over their, their own Halloween aesthetic. Yep. I mean, this probably is one of the first ones to get trimmed if you're going with less than 10 stories. Most likely. Although I wouldn't have. I might have given some more background to the two of them. But I, again, Dana Gould and James Duvall are just are are great in it and it's just a fun little story plus i loved he had the headset tied up to uh his skeleton in the front yard dana gould did so he was talking through that and that made for the funny moment when he's like don't 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 you do it when it when he cuts the head off the skeleton because <laughs> it moved with him too oh i love i love that this was it was fun there's not much to say about it but it was cool it also had a bunch of, I'm sure there was a ton of cameos of people that were like in that crowd that I didn't recognize off the top. Looking Adam through. Green plays one of the officers. He's the director of the Hatchet movies. Okay. All right. Officer Carlo. Actually, he plays Officer Carlo in like two different uh, segments, but I can't remember what the other one was. Oh, because he shows up again at the end in, um, in the Bad Seed segment. Is that what it is, the end? At the, at the, yeah. uh, at the police station. Yeah, and I'm seeing like Thomas Blake Jr. I've seen that name before. Um, Alyssa Dow Dowling. Um, so yeah, that one was fun. Uh, after that, we got Friday the 31st. Uh, Yay! I, I put this in the lower tier, and it was only because... <sighs> it's it's not because it wasn't fun. It was just because they're just it it wasn't as good as some of the other ones. But But what was great about it was this was just fun. Like it's it's your straight up Friday the Thirteenth serial killer chasing the girl until the alien shows up, and then the little alien, the little claymation the alien was cutest. adorable. Oh, trick or treat! I want one. Uh, uh, uh. That was that was honestly my favorite part was when the Jason character is like confused and trying to trying to communicate to the alien that he has no candy. <laughs> but he, he can't speak, so he's just like patting himself down and then he just gets frustrated and stomps on it and walks away. <laughs> oh, but this one was fun cuz it, it takes over her body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she becomes like a yes. zombie creature and then they just kill each other. And it was just fun. This Actually, this one was my favorite. This had shades yeah, of so much fun. It's got it's got some Evil Dead feel to it in parts, like including the Evil Dead book. Yeah, the Necronomicon <laughs> uh, oh is in there, um, but like the way that they're fighting each other and just how ridiculously over the top it is. The glowing just... eyes gave me that feel. It was a lot of fun. Like I can't I can't say that I didn't like this, and I and I would absolutely keep this story and and all of that. Um, I just there was some that had more story to them that I liked. But as far as just a like fun little interstitial, this was great. It was just because it was just so crazy over the top and way too much fun. And then that little alien, that little I want, I want that little Aww. alien. Trick or treat! Yes, please, trick someone treat. make it. Trick or treat! Trick or treat! <laughs> trick or treat! It was like this. Oh, so cute. Like they dropped him off to do this. <laughs> That would have been great. Like when your mom drops you off in the good neighborhood for candy. Yeah. All right, we'll be back in an hour. And takes off. <laughs> so that was um, that one was fun. Uh, the next one though is my favorite of the of all of them, and that's the oh, ransom yeah. of Rusty Rex. Um. So <laughs> we get John Landis first of all, great cameo, right? Because John Landis is awesome. American Werewolf in London, Trading Places. All that kind of stuff, um, but yeah. the two guys, the the two guys that are doing the kidnapping, uh, I love Sam Witwer. He was the um, the dark haired one, the one that gets hit in the balls. <laughs> uh, and then Jose Pablo Cantillo, uh, I've seen in stuff too. 
and he's great. And the two of them had really good chemistry um, and they worked well with each other. But I just love this idea that they have this plan to kidnap this millionaire's son who we have seen that character wandering around. He popped up in one of the, I think it's Ding Dong maybe, um, which is the yeah. one thing that I thought this movie did really well was just having like the trick-or-treaters showing up in multiple mov- in multiple segments throughout the night. Um, but they kidnap the kid. And <laughs> first of all, the one guy's like, yeah. I don't I don't really want to do kidnapping. Are you sure? And he's like, look, we're doing this. All right. This is, he's got the money. It doesn't matter. They kidnap the kid, and then they call the ransom in, and the dad's like, oh, great. You can keep him, and hangs up. <laughs> and, and it's – Well, yeah, I mean – I You've made right a terrible that, mistake. That kid walks weird. <laughs> <laughs> he does, but, you know. Um, no, it's uh, – Sam Witwer is what makes this one for me, though. He kills it. He is so good in this entire segment. Um just his reaction to the dad hanging up and I'm like, wait, what? Oh. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Calls him back. Uh, hi, it's me again. Uh, <laughs> why did you hang up on me? You know, we le- leave me alone. We don't. Him. Yeah. You can keep him. Never call this number again. Click. <laughs> he's just so confused by it all. Um, he just, he's great throughout the whole thing. I cannot say enough good things. And I love like Sam Witwer is a fantastic actor. He is um, the voice of Darth Maul in all of the Clone Wars, animated Rebels, all that kind of stuff in Star Wars. He um, he did. He was the villain in, I think it was season two of Supergirl, uh, and he was great in that. Um, he is a fantastic interview. If you ever get a chance to see interviews with him, especially when he starts talking about Star Wars stuff that he's been involved in, like. He he was giving an interview talking about um, something. They were in like a table read, and this was early on when he had been cast in uh, in Star Wars. And he said something. He basically schooled Dave Filoni about a moment in Star Wars, and people were just like, "This guy knows this. Like he pays attention. He he's he's done his homework." Um, the other one was when he also did the voice and motion capture for Star Wars The Force Unleashed um, as Starkiller. And that was another one where he went into audition and they wanted, there was a part where he's supposed to, his character's supposed to meditate and build his lightsaber. And he's like, but my character wouldn't know how to meditate because he's never been taught that. So he would try to force everything together. And they're like, that's so much better than what we wrote. You have the part. Um, but he's great, and uh, he kills it in this. And of course, he gets racked in the nuts and has that great line: "My nuts got hit by a monster, dude." And uh, he just—it's so much fun. This when it gets it's revealed a, that it's a monster, that it's like Mordecai. Yeah. There's some weird. I can't. You guys will probably be able to help me. Is like the way that it's like this. They find out it's this demon that'll never leave them, and. Stuff that was, it reminded me of something else. I don't know if it's like another segment from another horror anthology or show, or, but it just, I love that turn of like realizing and John Landis and everything. Just, there's something so familiar about it, you know? Well, again, it feels very much like something out of a uh, creep show or out of Tales from the Dark Side, right? It's that Tales, sort of, yeah, probably Tales from the Dark Side. There might have even been a Tales from the Dark Side exactly like it, for all I know. Um, or a very it similar feels. story, but it just has that feel to it, right? Where it's like these guys Oof. think they're going to do something, and then all of a sudden, it's not what they thought at all, and now they can't get away from it. And even the the dad, they keep calling yeah. him. He's like, "Look, we were held hostage by this thing for five years. It just showed up one day. You can have it." And when they they light it on fire and leave it on the doorstep, and they get into the van, it's like, "All right, let's just drive until dawn." And then just keep driving. And so they leave. And it, again, has that wonderful cliffhanger ending where he comes back. You know, he's at the convenience store. He's eating his hamburger. And he comes out to the van. And he looks in the back seat. And there's there's Rex just eating a candy bar. And then he picks up the head of his buddy. Starts chewing on the head. And just scream. <laughs> cut to black. I loved it. It was easily my favorite one was was the ransom of Rex. Rusty That's Rex. A good one. It was so good. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I absolutely love that. And then our final one was Bad Seed. This was the Neil Marshall. Um, this had some influence of, uh, I feel like there was a little bit of sort of Halloween 3 influence in there with like the weird pumpkin. Because yeah. the pumpkin gets carved mm -hmm. and the guy's like, check out the pumpkin that I carved. And uh, then it attacks him. And that was great when she comes walking into the in there and it's just on his head. And it like bites his head off. Yep. Um, this is where <laughs> you saw the cops again, right? Because um, yeah, Kristen uh, Kleba, I believe is how you'd pronounce it. Um, she, she's the um, detective McNally. Uh, when she goes back to the police station, she runs into those two cops from earlier that are covered in chocolate. <laughs> like, what happened to you? Uh, some kid ate a whole bunch of chocolate, and, blah, 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 and they're like eating the chocolate still. It was, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It was such a gross moment. <laughs> um, they oh. had uh, when uh, did you notice the guy that they were bringing in? Like the the dude dressed in all hospital scrubs, covered in markings and stuff. It was uh, it was um, what's his name? His character? Not Sam from, Neil, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, it wasn't Sam <laughs> Neil, but it was supposed to look like him. I love that. Uh, this had, again, a bunch of the cameos, right? Um, it had Pat Healy, uh, John Savage, We've I've seen in stuff before. I loved that the sketch artist, when she goes up to the sketch artist and he turns his sketch around <laughs> and it's just that crayon yeah. jack-o'-lantern and he's holding the crayons. Do you know who that was? That was Drew Struzan, was the actor, which if you've ever seen, like, the old Star Wars movie posters or E.T. or all those old posters that just have that really, it's a very unique look, but he is an amazing artist, mm. fantastic artist. Oh, that makes it funnier. So to have him being <laughs> Rembrandt killed me. I love that so much because I, I, I follow him on Twitter. He, uh, his, his posters are like unique. There's a, it's a style yeah. almost of movie poster. Um, then we also had, uh, so <laughs> the killer pumpkin that she ends up chasing around town and just the mayhem that's going on with it. And I loved how it sprouted little, uh, like vine tentacles and would crawl around. Um, and then, Very uh, good. after she kills it and they, they find out, you know, they, they see the, the thing on it. They go to, uh, professor Milo Gottlieb was played by Joe Dante. Joe Dante. <laughs> another great that. cameo director yep and, director and another cameo. great uh ending where they're like i don't see what the problem is and you just see that giant warehouse full of these special pumpkins yep. and cut to black like i just I, that was a f bad seed That's was a, a really fun ending. one it's a great like ending it. And it tied it tied a lot of the stories into each other too, with the police station and everything that's going on, and like them talking about the the captain talking about all the crap they've been seeing that night. Somebody saw an alien. Somebody saw you know, whatever whatever dude, kids holding up liquor store or convenience stores. Like, I loved that. Um, that was super fun. Mm -hmm. I I really enjoyed this as a uh, as an anthology because it was fun. Yay. That's I was talking with a friend earlier today about it and um, they didn't like it very much because it was sort of pitched to them like, Oh, this is the next trick or treat. And I don't see it that way because trick or treat, especially is one it's very dark, right? The stories are pretty, yeah. uh, pretty like just dark and, and creepy, but also um, very down. And this this one is very much embracing this fun side of a horror movie. It's campy and it doesn't yeah. take itself too seriously. And it's just having fun with the holiday and fun with all of its silly stories. It's embracing the goofiness of some of these stories like killer jack-o'-lanterns and all sorts of stuff. Exactly. Like that. And teeny tiny little aliens that can possess your body. Yes. <laughs> and I think all, I think also that's why Trick for me is the one that's probably the lowest is because it doesn't fit the fun vibe of everything else nearly as much. True. Yeah. yeah. And and especially like you have something where Adrian Morbo is like recreating as Faye said like her famous uh, 
like radio show thing from the fog this is like this is like a movie for for classic well not classic because now we're if we're doing not like dana Gould's classic but like 80s 80s horror movies it just has so much like the cheese and the camp mm -hmm. and the just like it's it's made for 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 us it is it's also it, it has a great tone to it and the fact that it's you know it's got all its little easter eggs for your old horror movies and your horror creators and the fun cameos that they threw in there i mean stuart gordon mm -hmm. getting him to play sherlock holmes mm -hmm. Just he basically yeah. doesn't do anything but sit there and appear on screen, but that's fine. Like that's a lot of fun having Joe Dante and uh, you know Barry Bostwick, John all Landis. of those. Uh, John Landis, oh, it's great. Yeah. Like all these great little cameos and all the Carpenter references. I loved every one of those. It at the end I of wish the day, Carpenter was in this. <laughs> oh, that would have been the thing, right? That would have put it over the top. He should have been cherry. He should have been like just sitting in the police station while everything is going on, just in the background, or like recreated this... his body bags character or something. Yes. Like oh, that would have yes. been great. Oh. I like that. That would have loved that. That would have been wonderful. <laughs> but yeah, this is one. As long as uh, a little bit of blood doesn't bother you, like there, because there is gore in it. It's not PG thirteen, even though you could have easily made this PG thirteen. I feel like. Um, but it is R rated, but it's not a hard R. And I do think that this one is, this is worth watching around this time of year. This is a fun little anthology to throw on because it's just 10, 10 quick short stories. I, this was a great choice. So you did good. You good. You did good bringing this one. I, I like this. I win. <laughs> And again, noticing, you know, the and it's the little subtle ones like the Snake Plissken costume or uh, the um, Rufio costume or the, the Carpenter Bar. Like, those were just fun little additions. Um, is this going to win any awards? No. But again, I'm not looking for that. And I'm not looking for it to be super scary. Like, I wasn't sure when it started because I knew it was R-rated and that's really all I knew about this going into it. So... By midway through the first story, I had an idea of what I was in. And that made it better the whole way through. Because now I was like, okay, cool. So we're having fun. It's the fun side of Halloween. Here we go. Um, which I think you need. I don't think every horror movie has to try and scare you. Not all of them are going to anyway. I mean, especially if you're Faye and you're not scared by anything. But <laughs> Yeah. But not every... Mm -hmm. like we Last week, we watched Get Out, right? And Get Out is a phenomenal movie. And it's creepy, and it's got a message to say, and all this kind of stuff, and it's fantastic. And I think that's I also it's also great to have something frilly and popcorny, and just like, hey, here, watch watch the cheese, enjoy it, embrace it. Halloween is supposed to be fun, and uh, and I really like that because it did mix in like creepy moments. I mean, uh, the the gr grim grinning ghost had a creepy factor to it. Because it's the whole, like, something's following you and you're not quite sure. But it's not too much. It follows. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did capture a couple of clips. Not much. Because uh, this wasn't a super, Yay! like, clip-filled movie, I didn't feel like. Um, but we got, uh, just because this was, I loved the way that uh, Sweet Tooth said trick-or-treat. And the way they modulated the voice. So I caught, captured that, and it sounds a little something like. Like, yeah, that'd, that'd creep me out if I was a kid that age. And I heard that. I heard a knock at my door, and I'd poop myself and hide. I'd be like, no, thank you. <laughs> no, we have no, we have no candy here. Um, but then I love the way that ended. The parents. They ate all of my candy. Yeah. They sure did. Yes, they did. Uh, so here's a long form of Barry Bostwick asking about Billy's mom. By the way, Billy, is your mother dressing up again this year? Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Um, that was good. And then, of course, we get the eyebrows. Dinga, dinga, dinga. Uh, that, that, I was like, oh, okay. Yep. Going full on cartoon. Good work. Yep. 
and just hmm. Um, so that was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. <clears throat> I mentioned that I really liked the week in the wicked, and all through it was great, except. This is the least intimidating attempt to be intimidating that I may have ever heard. And it's when Alice is pouring the Everclear on him and like walking around. And she says it, you know, it makes sense that we would meet up on All Hallows Eve. Tell me this is not the least intimidating attempt you've ever heard. On All Hallows Eve! It sounds sounds like someone's little sister trying to be scary but they they just they're too adorable to be scary it's it's how it came off to me kind of yeah actually (laughs) oh so i don't know that just (laughs) the way that played out and then to have her get you know torn apart by the giant demon was satisfying um I have one more. It's, it just says give you. I don't know what this one is. I don't remember now. So we get to find out together. I saw a doctor and he made it so that I couldn't give you one. That's what it was. Oh. Ugh. The husband's heel turn. Ugh. She just wanted a baby, man. She just wanted to have a four-armed red painted baby. There's just something about him in his stupid costume having a flashback alone while, you know, right before they do the whole second ear trick-or-treating thing. I don't know, there's something so annoying about it. Yeah, and I mean, my first view of it, I didn't see it quite that same way because I just don't have that perspective. But then seeing it a second time, uh, because I did watch it a second time, and then hearing you mention, like, it's really terrible that he did that, you're right. Like, that's even if she is a, a weird blood demon with four she's arms. She's your wife. She's you still married. Like her. that's the whole. It's the pinnacle of marriage. You have to have trust. If you don't have trust, then what are you doing? If you don't want to be married to her, then you shouldn't be married to her. Mm. There you go. Um. So I mentioned that my favorite was um the the ransom of Rusty Rex. Dread. What's do you have a favorite amongst the ten stories? Trick or treat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. I'm fits sorry. Me. Like, first of all, it's Friday thirteenth. They do the thing with it's Friday the thirty first, which is just how has no one ever thought of that before? Yeah. That's, That's right. so brilliant. Uh, and then you have the whole Jason lookalike thing. It's cool. Then suddenly aliens. What? What aliens? And then it's just a cute alien. <laughs> And then they go, as you said, like Evil Deadish with the whole, like, now I'm going to chop something of you off, and now you do it for me, and we're going to take a different weapon every time, because why would we use the same weapon? Right. And they just, like, it's, it's so much fun, that one. Yep. And the so chainsaw. Definitely, yeah. and... I did, like, yep. pull starting the chainsaw with his teeth was great. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. you only had one arm. That's true. <laughs> That's very true. You got to find ways. No, you know what? The more I think about it, uh, the higher that one ranks on my list because it's just like, it's just. We've affected fun. him. You have. Aha, no, finally. honestly, because it Come just to the cheese side. It just wants to be goofy, and as much as I love, you know, Sam Raimi and Evil Dead and all of that, and the the feel that that one gives me. So, and that also that makes sense that that would be your favorite in this. I like that. Uh, Monica, how about you? What's your favorite one? God, I really, I do, I do like all of them, um, with the exception of, um, you know, kind of the one with the witch guy with the baby thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if I had to pick one, you know, if you're forcing me, I'm going to go with uh, Grin Grimming Ghosts mm. because it had a very, it reminded me a bit of like Poe, like a Poe poem too. Yeah. There's just something I really liked about it. Like that dark and alone and that that like alone thing is like a that's a scary thing for for a woman to be alone and not have her car, not have her phone. It's just extra amped up. Mm-hmm. And the cool cameos, of course. Cool cameos. It does it has your kind of your solitude moments where she's walking down the street, where she's in her house. 
that kind of stuff. That fits. Exactly. I like that's a good that's a good one. It's it was in my top uh my top half for sure was Grim Grinning Ghost. Faye, how about you? Did what was your favorite? Same as Dread. Friday the thirty first. I mean, <laughs> it's just fun. Yep. That one is literally yeah. a all right, we've got a few minutes to kill, uh, so let's kill. Um <laughs> And it was just, it was every trope. I would have picked that. Yep. <laughs> I would have picked that to be my number one, but I knew Faye was going to pick it and then Dread picked it as well. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I got to pick something different too. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the Dorothy outfit she was wearing. Yep. <laughs> I love that because it's kind of like, like, even though it wasn't her because she was dead, it was kind of almost like her getting revenge as well. Mm -hmm. You yep. know? A little bit. Great. So yeah, uh, those are good ones. I think the for me the two weakest are Trick and Ding Dong. Um, Trick has a good has the better concept of the two that I think could actually play out in like a even like a, a short film, like a thirty minute, forty five minute film. Uh, I think would work better because that one just needed more. It's not as nearly it's it doesn't have the fun aspect of things obviously on the camp. Um, but I just think that it needed a little more breathing room. And then Ding Dong, again, I would have structured a little bit differently, and the husband is poop in his crappy Hansel costume in his later hosen. <laughs> so bad. That the I child can't take was seriously. wearing, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. So, yeah, that is uh, Tales of Halloween. Worth, worth seeing, for sure. Uh, it's, it's on a bunch of services right now too. If you haven't seen it yet, um, you've got some time it's on, I watched it on Amazon prime. I think it's on Tubi and freebie and a couple of the ad supported ones. So it's, it's around out there. It's um, also on Amazon. That's where I watched it was Amazon prime. So, uh, totally worth seeing is a great choice. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it and I'm glad that everyone else did as well. It's always fun, too, when we have more than one person watching something for the first time. Uh, in this case, Faye and I. <laughs> I'm surprised, Faye, that you hadn't seen it. That would be the most surprising one. It feels like, just feels like it would have been one. One that I never just got around to. Well, now you have. There's you only check... so much time in the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can yeah. check it off the list. Or not sleep. That's the other option. Just never sleep. Then you have more time. It's yeah. like an extra eight to ten yeah. hours you could spend uh, watching movies. Yeah, what do you yep. need sleep for? Nobody needs sleep. Yeah, yeah. Sleep depravity and driving goes really well. Sure. I used to do it all the time. No. <laughs> no, it does not. It does not go well. Um, now, if you enjoyed this conversation we had tonight, uh, you should check out our other podcast, The Four of Us Do Together, Gore. Um, if you're not Gore. already listening to Gore, you should be because it's a lot of fun. comes out uh, twice a month. And uh, Monica, let people know about Gore. Where can they find it, and what are we? What 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 is our most recent, and what is upcoming? Let people know. Give them some well, Gore info. Yes. So if you want to listen to Gore, you can find out all of you know where you can listen to it, or listen to it on the website itself at gorepodcast.com. Uh, we just um, not just okay. So like a week ago, we released our Friday the Thirteenth part three episode on friday the 13th and that was a great episode this friday we're going to release which i guess you release on wednesday so it's like a couple days from now you can listen to our halloween three episode that will be released yes, yes. so it's gonna be very exciting more halloween we're just like all up in your ear holes and stuff and uh yeah we're fun we are. It's a it's a ton of fun to do the show. Um, you pick some some fun movies to do because we don't we it's just horror, right? We don't have like we go watch old school horror. We've done I think as far back the oldest one we've done Wolfman, right? Nineteen forty one. Yes. We, Wolfman. So we've, I we've, want to do more old stuff. I do too. I'm definitely planning on it. And Frankenstein uh, and yeah. So we go all the way back to that to, to brand new stuff, uh, anything in the horror genre. Um, we have a lot of fun with it. The four of us really enjoy talking about it. We have our the 13. We, we list all our favorite tropes. That's a fun thing that we do. Um, occasionally when we will uh, rank, um, 
you know, franchises as by our, our favorite installments. Ooh. That's always fun to we do. We might have some of that coming up in yeah. the new year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, keep an eye out for that. Also, uh, oh. also uh, sequing for you, Travis, but uh, next week you might be able to update your ranking of something we've ranked earlier. This is true. This is true because next week the four of us are going to wrap up Spooktober with 2013's Evil Dead. I have not seen it before. As much of a Whoa. fan of the Evil Dead franchise as I am, I have not seen the new stuff, and I'm going to fix that. So I love those old Evil Dead movies, and I know it's very different, but I'm very much looking forward to seeing this one. So um, that's going to be. Are you going to watch Rise as well? Uh, I mean, I will, but not till after. You know, not right away, but I will I'm end up curious. watching that one. Um, so that's going to be next week as we wrap up Spooktober and the Gore Podcast takeover of Wait You Haven't Seen. It's been a whole lot of fun. If you enjoy this and you want to hear me do this show live, I do Sunday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern time at twitch.tv slash TV's Travis. May also be coming live streaming to YouTube soon. We'll see. I got to figure out how I can set that up um, and simulcast. Uh, you can get the video version of it at YouTube on Wednesdays or audio version Wednesdays anywhere you get your podcasts. Um, and uh, if you are a patron of this show, patreon.com slash WYHS, for as little as a dollar an episode, you get episodes, you get the audio version a few days early, uh, and you get first look at video projects that I'm working on outside of um, just this particular show. So the video version isn't necessarily any sooner there um although i might start putting it up there too um but other projects that i'm working on uh will be there there's also monthly movie nights on my patreon patreon access uh to special spots all that good stuff so that's and you can find all of that at my website tvstravis.com uh also links for merch are there so definitely check that out and uh word of mouth spreading and um rates and reviews of the podcast and your favorite yeah. podcatcher always helpful uh appreciate those so that is going to do it for Tales of Halloween. I can't wait for next week. I am super excited to watch Get Out, or not Get Out. I was I was excited to watch Get Out last week, <laughs> so much so that it's still on my brain. But I'm really excited to watch Evil Dead Good. next week. Um, 2013. Yes, because it's one that I've been wanting to do for a while. Year. Yes, Evil Dead 2013. We'll make sure and and say that plenty during during the episode. But thank you all for being here tonight. Yes, Faye. Just remember, it's 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 the Evil Dead versus Evil Dead. True. Yes. True. Oh, but names. I still want to say 2013. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but thank you all. We'll for We'll see being how here. I feel watching it again. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for being here, Dread. Thank you for uh, flying across the pond to be with us in our normal time zone. It was, uh, it was, yeah, uh, just for this. It was That's so nice of you to I do just for, for just for my yeah. show. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, uh, until next week for Monica, for Dread, for Faye, I'm Travis saying that, uh, remember to enjoy your movies and, uh, don't forget to check your candy. It's been a week you haven't seen. Are you kidding me? My nuts were viciously assaulted by a monster dude.